Today's lesson is going to be about Windsor chairs. We have an assortment here of Windsor chairs. Um, and first, let's talk about what makes a Windsor chair a Windsor chair. Windsor chairs are designed in such a way that the seat divides the chair in half. The elements above the chair don't go any lower than the seat, and the elements below the chair don't go any higher than the seat. So they all attach, and the seat is the primary portion. Notice all of these spindles come down and they terminate in the seat. And the same thing happens with all the, the leg structure. It all ends at the seat. Other kinds of chairs, for example, a chair like this, you may have a chair like this at home, um, is not a Windsor chair. Because notice how the, the portion of the back here follows down and becomes part of the leg. So this would not be a Windsor chair. It's a different style of chair. There are many different styles of chairs out there. But this is just a sample of a chair that is not going to fit into that category of a Windsor chair. I'll put this back out of the way. And let's talk about Windsors. Okay, first of all, Windsors years back used to be made by hand. Chair makers made them for many years. Um, and they, they came over from England. Many of them settled in New York or Pennsylvania or in Boston, and they all had their own little style. If you were an expert in Windsor chairs, you could look at the shapes of the turnings and the little details on how the chair was made and know if it was a Boston Windsor or if it was a Pennsylvania Windsor or New York Windsor. You might even know the chair maker if you were that good. Um, nowadays, when we make chairs, they're made in a factory. Here's an example of a factory-made Windsor chair. Now, this is a Windsor because the, the seat, the back elements terminate in the seat and so do the legs. But this is made in a factory. Um, you may have chairs at home that after a while start to get loose. Like you can see, this one is getting a little bit loose. All right? A handmade Windsor tends to hold up longer. These were made back in the 1700s, and there are still some in existence today from that time frame. Um, only the wealthy had chairs back in the day because they were made by hand, one at a time, and um, you know, they were just expensive, so only the wealthy had them. But some have survived the test of time, 200 years or so, and are still together. Well, what makes them last so long? Do you think this chair is going to make it to 200 years? Probably not 20. So um, they were made differently in those days. So let's take a look at how they were made differently especially the legs. And we, let's take a look at the legs and see how they were made. Now here's a stool that is a Windsor style stool. My students are making this. If you're a student in my class, this is the stool you're making. And it is fashioned after Windsor chairs, basically a chair without a back. Um, but the, the legs and everything fit into the seat in the same manner that um, a regular Windsor chair does. So here's a seat. I've cut it apart so you can see what the inside looks like. Here's one of the legs, and you'll notice the legs fit into a tapered hole. It's kind of like an ice cream cone. And every time you sit in the chair, if that leg wiggles around a little bit and gets the hole looser, every time you sit in the chair, it gets, it gets jammed in there and gets tight again. Chairs nowadays are made with a straight hole. And you can see, like, this was a, a chair seat, I hold it the right way, and make believe this was a leg. It's a straight tenon on the leg. This is called a tenon, and this is the hole, and it would fit in here. Now, as time goes, and you lean back and forth in the chair, and this hole gets reamed out a little bit because the wood fibers crush, there's nothing that's ever going to tighten that back up again, and eventually what's going to happen? The leg's going to fall out. Also, you'll notice that the common day chairs don't have the legs coming through the top of the seat. They stop short of the seat, so there's no way they can go in further anyway. Okay, but the Windsor leg can do that. If you take a look at the chairs, you'll notice that the legs do come through. In fact, when you're making the stool, there's a, a hole. You can see that the leg is going to come through the hole. It's going to get trimmed even. A wedge is going to get driven in and hold it in place. Okay. So that's what holds it there. Now, if you take a look at the chairs themselves, you'll notice the handmade Windsors, the stool that you're making, you can see, I don't know if the camera can see it, but you can see the leg coming through the top of the seat, and there's a wedge in there. And then even on these chairs, and these are painted, but you can still see the imprint of where the leg comes through. 
you see the four legs coming through with it. And if you can look closely, you can even see there's a wedge. And that's what holds it in place. So every time you sit in that seat, this is not going to get any looser. Right? Even some of the other components of this chair are wedged as well, like these spindles, as they come through, there's a little teeny wedge in the top of each one of them to hold it in place, and as these come through, there's a wedge here as well. But it allows the, the, um, the leg and the chair to stay as one unit. So there's essentially three things that we talk about that keep the legs solid on a Windsor chair. Now, if you're a student of mine and you have the handout that goes with this, we list right at the top, it says, what are the why are legs so strong and wiggle free on a handmade Windsor chair? Now, it does not include the machine made ones because they don't have these same elements. But first of all, the chair makers use that tapered tenon like I just showed you, right? And that, that tapered tenon, that alone lets the, the seat get in there, the leg get into the seat nice and tight. The legs are drilled through the seat, which we also showed you, and are wedged from the top. So after the, the leg goes through, a wedge is driven in from the top, and the wedge has to go in perpendicular to the grain, by the way. The grain of the seat, see if I can hold this here and show you. The grain's going this way, so the wedge has to go this way. If you put it the same way, it would split the, the seat in half. But the, the, a slit is made in there, and the wedge is driven in, which spreads out the top of the leg, really gets it in there good and tight. So the legs go through the seat and are wedged from the top. That's the second reason that the legs stay solid. So you have a tapered tenon. This is called the tenon. The legs go through the seat and are wedged from the top. That's reason number two. And then the third reason, which is pretty sneaky that these uh, chair makers did, when you sit in a chair, what do you typically do? You sit in the chair and you lean back. And when you lean back, what are you doing to those legs? You're pushing them apart. So what they're doing, what they did was they made the stretchers, these are stretchers, longer than they're supposed to be. So if you were to put this all together without the stretcher in there and measure from here to here, you would think that you'd cut that stretcher to fit that distance. Well, what they did is they added a quarter of an inch and made these too big, so these legs are already pushing apart, so they're trying to close in on that stretcher. So the, the, the legs are under stress already, so the chances of them opening up even more is really, really slim. So the legs are always trying to push together. So the three reasons that the legs are nice and solid on a Windsor chair, tapered tenons, tapered tenons on the legs, they come through the seat and are wedged from the top, and the stretchers are under tension. We call that preload, right? When they're longer than the visual distance that's there. All right, so those are the three reasons that Windsor chairs the legs on them stay solid for such a long period of time. Um, now, the next thing on your handout, you'll notice about how these are assembled. When you look at a chair, when this is put together, there's a lot of parts that have to go together all at the same time, especially if you're doing a chair and you have all these spindles that have to fit into those holes. The kind of glue you use matters. Now, back in the day, they used hide glue, which a, a woodworker would melt in a pot and put in there and then um, put the chair together. But nowadays, we use other kinds of glue, but we need a glue that's going to have a long open time. In other words, we don't want the glue to start to grab right away. So the typical yellow carpenter's glue is not a good choice for putting together a chair because that kind of glue works really well, but it starts to grab right away. And that's a problem because you might get a couple of things in position and then want to come back and adjust them and they're already glued in place. So you want to have a glue that's going to give you a little bit of time to fiddle with things. You know, sometimes these Spindles are handmade, sometimes they have a slight curve to them, so you might want to get that face in the right way and turn them a little bit. And if you don't use the right kind of glue, that's not going to, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, same thing when you're putting the stretchers together. Getting them this stretcher parallel to this stretcher um, is important. So you don't want the glue to grab until you get things in the right spot. So we typically use a white glue when assembling this. And again, my students, you want to be aware of that, it's going to show up on a test. The kind of glue that we typically use for assembling a chair is white glue, like Elmer's glue. And that glue stays movable for a longer time. It has a longer open time, we call it, and allows you to position things before it starts to really grab. Now, when you're shaping the seat, first of all, let's talk about how the seat, what the different parts of the chair are made out of. Back when the chairs were made by the chair makers, 
they didn't do things like we do. Nowadays, chairs are stained because we like the way the wood looks. But back in the day when they were making chairs, they painted them. And they were typically painted a color. In fact, they were almost called green chairs instead of Windsor chairs because people typically would paint them green and put them out in the garden. Green matching the garden. Um, so they didn't really care what the kind of wood was as far as appearance goes. So they used the wood according to its characteristics. For example, the seats are typically made out of a soft wood. We usually use pine. Soft woods shape easily, and when you drive the, the wedge into the leg, that seat can give a little bit and conform to the shape that's happening with the wedge in the top of the leg. So that softer seat is important. So typically, the seat is made out of pine. The next one we want to talk about is the legs and the stretchers. Um, the legs and the stretchers, talk about them on the stool here, the legs and all the stretchers are made out of maple. And the reason they use maple, first of all, it's a strong wood. Maple is a hard wood. In fact, the floor in this house right here is maple, commonly used for flooring along with oak and a few other hardwoods. But So it's nice and strong and it's hard, but it turns nicely on a lathe. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, legs are made on a machine that spins the wood. It's called a lathe. And when the process of making anything, something on a lathe, you would say that you're turning something on the lathe. So baseball bats are made on a lathe, chair legs are made on a lathe, um, balusters on a handrail are made on a lathe. So all these things that are round, because they spin, are made that way. And maple is a wood that turns nicely. When you shape it, it works really nicely. For example, if you use oak on a lathe, you can do it, but it's a lot more splintery and it's hard to get a nice smooth finish. So the chair makers knew that, so they used a wood that was strong but also worked well on the lathe. So they would typically make it out of maple. So maple is a commonly used wood for all the turned parts on a, leg, on a chair. And on the stool we're making, the legs and stretchers are turned. And on the chairs here, you'll also notice these two front posts are made on the lathe. Right? But all the other ones are hand-shaped. These are not made on the lathe, even though they look like they are. They were made by hand with a spoke shape. Um, the next part is the, um, the wedges that we put in. Now, a wedge is going to get pounded on. So the characteristics you need here is it needs to be hard and can stand being hit. And oak or ash work really well for this. So oak and ash kind of go together for all the stuff we're going to talk about here because their characteristics are really, really similar. Um, but the wedge is put in here and hit with a hammer to be driven in there. So it has to be hard and stiff and be able to be hit with a hammer. Ash is commonly used in tool hat handles. For example, an axe handle is typically made out of ash. Um, baseball bats, original baseball bats were made out of ash. So you can, it, it's made to take that hit. So it can handle being smacked in there. And it would push into the, the maple leg nice and easily. Imagine if the wedge was made out of pine. You put pine on there and you hit it, it would just crumble. So it needs to be hard. So ash or oak work really well as wedges. And then the other part, um, we don't have them on the stool, but we have them on a chair. We call this the bow and the arm rail. Or on the, this chair, this whole thing is called the bow, which becomes the arm rail. And what do you notice about these? They've got to be bent. These started out as a straight piece of wood. They were shaped as a straight piece of wood, put in a steamer, and bent around. Also, these spindles fall into the same category. Now, these are not bent, but they're very, very thin and they're flexible. If you take a look at the machine-made chairs, the spindles on this are thicker because these are not handmade. They can't make, get them as thin when they do them on machine because they're not following the grain. We'll talk about that another time. But um, so the, the bow and arm rails and the spindles are also made out of oak and ash, the same material as the wedges were made out of. Not because they split well or can be hit well, but they bend nicely. Okay, so um, here we need a wood that's going to bend. Again, pine wouldn't go so well. Be tough to bend pine. Um, other woods can be bent, but they're a little bit more tricky and you have more failures and they'll split more. But oak and ash, again, are a nice wood for, for bending. They, you steam, put them in a steamer and they bend nicely. So again, just real quick, the woods, again, in review, the seats are made out of pine because they're soft and easily shaped. The legs and stretchers, anything that was turned on a lathe is made out of maple because it turns nicely on a lathe. The wedges get pounded into the seat, ochre ash because they can take the hitting. 
and also the arm rails and spindles are also made out of oak because they bend well and they can flex nicely. All right, and then a couple more things I want to talk about, and it is shaping the seat. Now the seat is not a flat piece of wood because that's just what would be comfortable to sit on. We have to hollow it out a little bit. And they had some particular tools that they used to hollow out the seat. We call that saddling the seat, like a saddle on a horse. Saddling the seat so it shapes your butt. Okay? And we go through a step of three different tools that we use, and I have them out over here. The first one is called a scorp. This tool, it looks like a draw knife, but it's curved. And this is the sharp edge here, and it's used to get the bulk of the wood out. It's a very rough tool. It's got a very sharp curve to it. And you use this first to get the majority of the wood out of there. So you use this first, so it's a scorp. Then once you have the, the, that lower section made, you switch to a hand plane called a compass plane. Now, excuse me, a compass plane is curved. Typically a compass is used to draw circles, so if you think of that, you'll draw a circle or an arc. It's got a curve looking at it from the side, and if you look at it straight on, it's also curved this way. So it's kind of a compound curve. And this kind of a plane, you wrap your hand around it, and then you can use this to shape this, the seat to saddle it out. Okay? You use this probably the most, because once you've pulled out the, the wood with the scorp, now you're going to shape it the way you want it with the compass plane. Okay? A little less curve than the scorp hat. It's a little bit of a flatter curve. Once you have it pretty much the way you want it, you're still going to see scoop marks where the, the plane iron, which is right here, has cut all the wood away. Um, so you go to a tool that has even a less of a curve, and that's this tool here. This is called a travisher. A travisher, here's the cutting edge, is used like this, and it used to shape the seat and do a, like a finish cut so that the scoops from the compass plane aren't as noticeable. You'll still see tooling marks, um, but a lot less. I kind of like a, a chair to have that, hand, you know, a handmade chair, be able to see the tooling marks. So after the travisher, I try not to do too much sanding because I kind of like that handmade look of the, the tooling marks from this tool that's left. They're very slight, but they're, they are visible, but they're very slight. So again, the tools you use for saddling the seat in order, scorp for the heavy stuff, compass plane to get the shape you want, and travisher to finish it up. Scorp, compass plane, travisher, in that order. You never know, you might see that on a test. Now, the one last thing to think about is when you're cutting the wood, it matters how you cut it because wood has grain to it. So if I was to take a look at the stool seat here, the grain on this goes this way, right? And the grain direction matters when you're cutting because you want to cut in such a way that you're cutting off of the fibers of the wood. So if I'm using the, any one of the three tools we just talked about, you have to think about how you're going to do that. Now, I've taken this, this seat again. I've cut it crossways, cut it in half. It was a whole seat, obviously, at one point. So we cut it apart so we can see the inside. And this, when the seat is saddled, it curves down this way. So if the grain fibers are going straight across, if my fingers were the grain fibers, I want to carve off of my fingers. If I go the other way, I'm going to catch the grain fibers and it's going to chip. It's going to take out chunks of wood. So I want to cut off of the fibers. So when I'm shaping the seat, I want to go downhill from either side because I go off the fibers. All right. Um, it's a lot like petting your dog. And if you come over here, I have a, happen to have a couple of dogs. You take a look at a dog's fur. Everybody is sleeping here. He's a little brown dog. His fur points this way. So if I pet him this way, his fur is going to stay flat. But if I pet him the wrong way, his fur stands up because his fur is pointing the other way. So it's the same concept when you're doing your seat. You want to go off the grain. Now, it's not, also, not just when you're doing the saddling the seat, but when you're shaping the edges, we use hand tools for that as well. And again, I've got grain fibers going this way. So the grain fiber meets this edge at an angle. So if I'm shaping this way, I'm going to get a nice smooth cut. But if I go this way, again, I'm going to catch those fibers and it's going to tear and I'm not going to be able to get a good cut at all and it's going to make all kinds of chips and 
maybe even chip off pieces. In fact, the very top and very bottom are the worst place. Um, what I did is here, it's on the back, I drew some lines, and you can kind of see, you've got four quarters here, and in each quarter, you want to go in a particular direction. The fibers here are pointing this way, so I'm going to go in this direction, so I go off the fibers in this direction, but in this quarter of the circle, I'm going to go this way. And then the, and it repeats down here. I'm going to cut in this direction here, or cut in that direction here. This is called reading the grain, knowing which way to make the cut. So if I'm on an outside circle, I want to go in a direction so that I'm angling off the grain fibers, not angling into them. And if I'm doing the seat, saddling the seat, again, I want to go off those grain fibers. I'm going to go downhill as I cut, right, not uphill. So that's what you want to be thinking about. And you'll notice that these other chairs, they have those same issues when you're shaping this, the outside of the seat. You have to think about those grain fibers. And you'll make mistakes, and as soon as a cut starts coming up funny or you're taking off big chunks and it's not supposed to happen, stop and look at which way the grain is going and think about it, and you'll realize that you're probably cutting off of the grain. So those are the things that I want you to think about when it comes to Windsor chairs. Um, Windsor chairs are beautiful pieces of furniture. You'll see them in all different styles. You might even see um, a bench that is a, a Windsor chair. Um, so um, this is our little presentation on Windsor chairs. If you're a student of mine, make sure you pull out these notes and take a look at them before you take the quiz. Um, all the information that we just talked about is on the top of the notes as well. Thank you very much.